better care for veterans? Can a new director with a bigger budget fix what's wrong with the VA health care system? The general comes home. The body of Major General Harold Green arrives at Dover Air Force Base from Afghanistan. Papal appeal. Pope Francis pleads with world leaders to protect Christians fleeing their homes in Iraq. And a growing health crisis, caring for the sick and dying while trying to slow the spread of Ebola. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, August 7th, 2014. Good evening from Washington. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick. As we look at your news now, a bittersweet victory for veterans tonight. That sweeping $16 billion bill to reform the scandal-ridden Veterans Affairs Department is now law. The bill will pay private doctors to treat vets who can't get prompt appointments or don't live near VA hospitals or clinics. It gives the VA secretary the power to fire poorly performing senior executives. And it helps veterans and their families afford college tuition. The president signed the bill with service members from Fort Belvoir and Virginia watching. He hailed it as a bipartisan solution to widespread abuses at some VA facilities that were exposed earlier this year. We've discovered some inexcusable misconduct at some VA health care facilities. Stories of our veterans denied the care they needed, long wait times being covered up, cooking the books. This is wrong. It was outrageous. And working together, we set out to fix it. Congress approved the measure last week, just before taking a five-week summer recess. It's one of the few major bills Democrats and Republicans agreed on this year. It's good to welcome back Amber Barno, military advisor for the Concerned Veterans for America. You heard our commander-in-chief talking about cooking the books and cover-ups and veterans denied service. As he said, isn't this outrageous? It is, and more than outrageous, it's unacceptable that our America's veterans, often coming home from war, serving their country um, honorably, have to face this sort of failure from a federal bureaucracy, from a VA that has for years been more concerned with protecting themselves than the veterans it was created to support. So there's a new VA chief. Now he has the authority to fire people who aren't doing their jobs or who have messed up. That's very unique for a federal agency, isn't it? It is, and it is a it is a requirement with this bill moving forward. It is something that needed to be put in. Um, most federal agencies, this doesn't exist. Once you're once you're past your probationary period, it's almost impossible to fire federal employees. So, a very good step forward in terms of fixing the VA and positive reform is allowing the secretary to fire or demote those top tier executives who aren't doing their jobs. So adding $16 billion to an already pretty fat budget for the Veterans Affairs Department. A lot of money here. Will money solve what's wrong with the VA? No. Funding has not been an issue. Funding has increased for the VA almost 60 percent since 2009. Uh, it is the mismanagement of them allocating those the resources and the funding to the right areas. So throwing money at the problem is not going to fix it. It's sort of giving them a free pass to their fiscal mismanagement with the money that was provided to them in the past. You're an Iraq veteran. As you look at this bill, what are the best parts of it as a veteran? Uh, two parts. Choice, veterans' choice. Now veterans who get put in these long wait times will have the ability to say, that's not good enough. I want to go seek out private health care options. So now veterans will receive a veterans uh, choice card where they will go to a, uh, a private facility where they can present this card and the, it will be paid for at the expense of the VA as long as it's within, uh, if their wait time is over 30 days or they're greater than 40 distance to a VA facility. And what was the other point? The other point is the accountability. That yeah. is crucial to fixing the the failed culture that we've seen within the VA over these past years. Amber Barno, it's always good to have you and we hope you come back. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been following in today's world. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry has arrived in Afghanistan for an unannounced visit. His arrival in Kabul today follows the killing Tuesday of a U.S. general by an Afghan soldier at the National Defense University. That underscored tensions that persist as the U.S. combat role winds down and the political uncertainty that Kerry is trying to address 
Two presidential candidates remain locked in a bitter dispute over election results now being audited in a process that Kerry brokered last month. He planned to see the candidates tonight, then meet with current Afghan President Hamid Karzai tomorrow. It was a solemn homecoming today for the American general, killed in Afghanistan this week. Major General Harold Green's remains arrived this morning at Dover Air Force Base in Delaware. Soldiers in full dress uniform carried his flag draped casket. The longtime officer was killed in an insider attack Tuesday while visiting a training facility in Kabul, Afghanistan. Green is the highest ranked U.S. officer to be killed in combat since the Vietnam War. While acknowledging the attack, the Taliban has not claimed responsibility for it. The Pentagon has launched a full scale investigation. The U.S. is weighing options over a growing humanitarian crisis in northern Iraq. Thousands of religious minorities are being displaced by Islamic militants. The White House is holding firm on one thing tonight, no American boots on the ground. The president's been clear about that, and that principle continues to hold. Uh, the president's also been clear that any sort of military action that would be taken in Iraq would be very limited uh, in scope and very specific to addressing uh, a core American objective. The White House has maintained reluctance to direct involvement in Iraq, even, though, even as the Islamic group ISIS has threatened to topple Iraqi's government. Along with airstrikes against ISIS militants, food drops to refugees are options that are still on the table. Pope Francis is calling for world governments to take measures to protect those Christians driven from their villages in northern Iraq. The Pope's second appeal in as many weeks came today as Iraqi militants from the Islamic State group overran a cluster of predominantly Christian villages. Tens of thousands are fleeing the villages that have been their home since the beginning of Christianity. Francis is appealing to the international community to, quote, put an end to the humanitarian drama underway, adopt measures to protect those who are threatened by violence, and assure them necessary aid, especially urgent for those who are homeless and depend on the solidarity of others. Russia is permitting NSA leaker Edward Snowden to stay in Russia for three more years. He faces espionage charges in the U.S. for leaking details about once secret surveillance programs. Snowden has not been granted political asylum. That would allow him to stay in Russia permanently. He does have a job in Russia now, which is key to extending his visa. In response to Western sanctions over its conflict with Ukraine, Russia is now banning imported food from the U.S., the EU, and other nations for a full year. Trucks loaded with food bound for the Russian border were turned away at the border today. American producers could lose billions, but the Russian people may bear the brunt of this ban. They are likely to face empty store shelves and sharply higher prices. Bone fragments have been uncovered on the Costa Concordia shipwreck. Italian authorities say they may belong to the last passenger unaccounted for since that cruise ship capsized and sank. January 2012, 32 people were killed. The Concordia was towed to Genoa's port last month to be scrapped. Closing arguments are underway in the Oscar Pistorius murder trial. The double amputee South African Olympic runner is accused of murdering his girlfriend, Reva Steenkamp. Pistorius admits fatally shooting her in the bathroom of his home. He claims it was self-defense, believing she was an intruder. South African courts do not use juries, so Pistorius' fate is in the hands of the trial judge. Final arguments in the case are expected to end tomorrow. The Hawaiian Islands are bracing for back-to-back -back hurricanes. Catherine Elliott reports. Call it a one-two punch. In the next few days, a very rare pair of hurricanes, Izel and Julio, will likely impact all of the Hawaiian Islands. Residents are bracing for hurricane force winds and a foot or more of rain, which could mean mudslides prone areas and, and vulnerable areas to take appropriate actions. The other thing is like our boaters to go and secure the vessels and moorings again in anticipation. Izel is expected to make landfall tonight. Forecasters say it will be a category one storm with winds of 80 miles per hour when it arrives. A hurricane warning is in effect for the Big Island. It's Hawaii's first in some 22 years. So folks in the Big Island around the state need to realize that this storm is anticipated to hold together and make a landfall on the Big Island later on today as a hurricane. Hurricane Julio will follow and is expected to lose strength as it approaches Hawaii over the weekend. <laughs> Residents also appear to be taking the rare warnings seriously. This one seems to be a little bit busier than normal just because of the severity with the one, the one right after it coming. While the storms move closer, Hawaiians were rattled by another natural disaster Thursday morning. I felt like an earthquake. 
the U.S. Geological Survey reported a magnitude 4.5 earthquake off the coast of the Big Island. No immediate damage was reported. Catherine Elliott, EWTN News Nightly. Coming up, facing the challenge of caring for the sick and dying while trying to stem the spread of the Ebola virus. And a week from today, Pope Francis arrives in Korea. We preview his apostolic visit to Asia. On Thursday, August 7, thanks for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick on EWTN News Nightly. Tonight, world health leaders are working frantically, trying to contain the largest and most complex Ebola outbreak ever. Our Wyatt Goolsby reports from the World Health Organization's office here in Washington. Wyatt? Brian, authorities here say that the death toll now stands at 932. They also say that the number of suspected cases is increasing. There are several now in Nigeria, one in Saudi Arabia. So now the question remains, what can the U.S. do to prevent the virus from spreading here? These symptoms are also seen in other diseases besides Ebola. Despite a recess in Congress, some lawmakers held an emergency meeting to figure out what can be done to contain the virus. This doesn't appear to be a change in the virus but it is a new development in how and where the virus is spreading and it makes control much more difficult. The Center for Disease Control has raised their emergency operations center to the highest state of alert. That means a call for more manpower. Europe's first Ebola patient arrived in Spain today. Father Miguel Pajares is a Spanish priest who contracted the virus in Liberia. He's now in stable condition, but before traveling to Spain, the 75-year-old spoke to CNN via Skype. I got a fever and drowsiness. I sleep. I'm always half asleep. I have no appetite at all. Today I spent the day without eating anything. I have no appetite and energy. Many Catholic organizations have remained in West Africa to treat patients. Dr. Stephen Morrison with the Center for Strategic and International Studies says it's tough going for those on the ground. So the faith community has been critical, but what is happening is they are getting sick and dying too. They are as vulnerable as anyone else because their service and their mission is to care for people when they're sick. Morrison says the virus is sparking fear and even panic. One of the most disturbing examples, this video of a man dying in the streets of Guinea's capital. Emergency services taking five hours to get him medical assistance as passersby looked on. One bright spot here tonight, Brian, two American missionaries who caught Ebola uh, are at this point in stable condition at Emory University in Georgia. So far, they are responding well to an experimental drug that may, that may very well end up being a cure to the virus. Brian? That is promising. Thank you, Wyatt. As we reported earlier, tens of thousands of persecuted Christians are fleeing their homes in northern Iraq. Now the online community is joining in an act of solidarity with them. This symbol, the noon, stands for Nazareans, a term of contempt for Christians. The Islamic State is marking homes and businesses owned by Christians with this symbol, so it can be used that way. In an act of global Christian solidarity, many people are changing their Facebook profile picture to the noon. Christine Sisto has written for the social media trend and joins us for National Review Online. Tell us what this symbol actually means as compared to how it's being used and translated by some of these groups. So the noon is just the 14th letter of the Arabic alphabet. It's basically the Roman letter N. And it's just, like you said, it's just the uh, first letter in the word al Nasra, the Nazarenes, which is another word for Christian that can be used in a sort of derogatory way. And ISIS is going around to all the homes in Mosul and marking an, uh, the noon on Christian home, homes and businesses in a way to kind of make Christians the other, the enemy, they're marking them, these are the bad ones. Um, but through social media, they're the, the We Are In campaign, they're trying to change that. So how is it catching on? Are, people, are there a lot of people involved in this? Um, it is a huge trend on social media. I remember the, uh, a few days ago, I woke up and I saw a lot of people had changed their profile picture to the noon. And I'm, I am kind of said to myself, why is everyone making their profile picture the letter N? And um, it's, a, it's surprisingly a lot of Christians and a lot of Muslims, not just Christians, are changing their profile picture. And they're sharing the, uh, the hashtag we are N, which is a way to show solidarity with Christian, their Christian brothers halfway across the world. So explain for those who aren't familiar with a hashtag how 
that can impact this dialogue here. So ISIS is trying to make the, the noon um, a sign of, a, a symbol of shame. So with the WeRN hashtag, um, the people that are uh, using that hashtag are trying to make it um, a symbol of pride. You know, we shouldn't be afraid to be Christians. And um, they're showing their solidarity with, with people across the world that are getting kicked out of their homes simply for what they believe in. You watch these trends. How effective do you think social media can be in a situation like this? You know, a lot of the time social media, I hate to say, is, is not that effective. It, it kind of becomes a big thing on, on the internet and then you don't really see it translating into the real world. But one of the great things about the WeRN campaign and the sharing of the noon is actually is making an impact all over the, all over the world. I actually just read before I came on a tweet um, about there's gonna be um, a protest in London um, demanding that leaders do something about the, the, the Christian genocide in Mosul with the hashtag we are in afterward after it um, i know that there's been protests in toronto there have been protests in detroit um protests across across america because of this this hashtag so when it goes from social media to action mm -hmm. it really can make a difference and it, it really has and you know when i was looking up research about this originally it was a lot of alternative publications that were reporting on it, Christian publications, uh, conservative publications, and social media really spread it and, and brought this situation to the forefront of, of uh, the mainstream media. So if someone is considering doing this, would you encourage them to join in this effort? Oh, of course. I think all Christians, not even just Christians, I think everyone, I mean, it's a, it's a human rights violation. Everyone should be at least tweeting about it, talking about it, share the letter, you know, share the noon, get it out there and, and maybe eventually something will be done. From the National Review Online, Christine Sisto, thanks for joining us tonight. Of course, thank you. Up next, Mark Irons visits some young cooks spending part of their summer serving others. And he tweets almost daily, but Pope Francis warns against wasting too much time in cyberspace. On this Thursday evening, thank you so much for joining us for EWTN News Nightly. I'm Brian Patrick. Well, summer break is beginning to wind down and some kids are staying in the kitchen, not raiding the refrigerator, they're serving others. Mark Irons has their story tonight. Zach Heinley loves video games. You know, I play video games all the time. But today he's put down the controller and picked up a plate, filling it with food. Welcome to some. Some, so others might eat. Today, Zach and other youth volunteer at this D.C. dining hall for those in need. Other people don't have as much as we do, and we take it for granted. The kids are serving up hot drinks and hearty meals, even handing out meal bags to go. Everybody needs an opportunity to get fed and to stay healthy. But summer break is almost over for these kids. What about having fun? Honestly, there's nothing better you can be doing with your time. Sure, it's serving people food, but it's the most fun you're going to have all day. You get to interact with people, you get to meet. Here in the nation's capital, some is doing some great work. And I got to tell you, the food's pretty good too. I think doing stuff like this just really fulfills what is said in the Gospels about how you should go out and serve others. So Zach has pressed pause on the video games and these kids will be back to serve. I wanted to keep coming back, it's just so fun. Mark Irons, EWTN News Nightly. I've gotta tell you, we didn't have to twist Mark's arm to cover that story. There's one thing he loves, it's eating. Well, we talked about this earlier with Christine about social media. The Pope tweets almost daily. He's also posed for selfies, but Pope Francis wants young people to cut down on their screen time and get into action. He told a group of German teenagers this week, to get off their smartphones and do something more productive with their lives. According to the translations of his remarks, the Pope stated, quote, Our life is made up of time, and time is a gift from God, so it's important that it be used in good and fruitful actions, end quote. The Holy Father warned against using technology in a way that distracts us from what's really important. Well, during his first trip to Asia as Pope next week, Pope Francis will deliver four speeches in English, which is kind of strange because he doesn't like to speak English, so it'll be a challenge for him. He will participate in Asian Youth Day and beatify more than 100 Korean martyrs. The Vatican says the visit will emphasize peace. Francis will celebrate Mass at the Cathedral in Seoul. 
A delegation from North Korea was invited to the Mass but has refused to attend. The trip will provide a rare opportunity, though, for the Pope to speak directly to the leaders of China. His plane on the way to Seoul will fly over China. Vatican protocol calls for him to send greetings to the leaders of that country. Of course, an EWTN News Nightly team is traveling with Pope Francis. Vatican correspondent Alan Holdren and his photographer will be on board the papal plane, and they will be with the Pope throughout his apostolic Asian visit, bringing us unique, insightful stories that you're not going to see anywhere else. Well, we thank you for joining us tonight. We'll see you tomorrow, and until then, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, watch again anytime on EWTN's YouTube page. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, I'm Brian Patrick. Thanks for joining us tonight. Good night, and may God bless you.